so blessed to have Omar Gutierrez with us tonight. He's the special assistant to Archbishop Lucas. He has studied in Rome. He's been published in all kinds of major, major publications. He has a book that's out that you can pick up later tonight if you'd like. He has more degrees and letters behind his name than I have time to read, and we're just so glad to have him. His wife's name is Miriam. He's been married 12 years. He has four children. Give it up for Omar. Thank you very much for having me. Those are all my children over there. I brought them because uh, there's an, an election year going on, and uh, I haven't seen them for <laughs> several days because I've been going around constantly talking about this because it's all very, very important as we uh, approach this year. You want me to stay still? Can I just go like this? Would that bother you? No, I'm okay. All right. Um, so uh, what I want to do is try to get through th these aspects of voting as a Catholic as quickly as I can so we have as much time as humanly possible uh, to, to ask questions and, and I can attempt to answer them. So I'm going to just talk about some ground rules, uh, voting in the Catholic vision, conscience, and a couple things from, from the bishop's document, Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship, which is free on the USCCB website. You can look at it and, and, and read it, download it in a PDF format, etc. Uh, so just the ground rules, uh, as I'm sure you know, as, a, as an employee for a nonprofit, I'm not allowed to mention candidates or parties. If any of your questions have to do with candidates or parties, I will ignore your question. <laughs> uh, I cannot talk about it because I work for the Archdiocese. I am, however, allowed to talk about public policy and legislation that I can talk about uh, in various different ways. Um, the tension that happens sometimes, however, is that we know certain public policy issues are associated with certain political parties, correct? So let's pretend there's a political party A and they have these three issues which are part of their foundational platform, right? Outlawing texting at movie theaters, which I think we all agree should be, should be done. Um, <laughs> then uh, a subsidizing Free Pie Wednesday, uh, which is, seems sane, right? Uh, and then rounding up guys named Omar for extermination. Right? When the church comes out and says a Catholic can't support rounding up guys named no more for extermination, right? everybody knows the church is talking about political party A. Right? The party knows it, the church knows it, and guys named Omar know it. Okay? Um, so what ends up happening, of course, is the church is referred to as being partisan because everybody knows, hey, you're talking about the political party, you're not allowed to do that. I'm just here to tell you that that's wrong. The church is not being partisan. The church is allowed, in fact, obliged to talk about public policy. That's what we're supposed to do. Our job as Catholics is that the Catholic Church is to talk about the church's teaching. And if that hurts your favorite uh, political party or favorite candidate, well, then I'm sorry. That's just, I, I, don't, I don't care if it hurts your favorite party, uh, political party. I'm here to talk about what the church teaches and to do it uncompromisingly. So what I want to do this evening is to talk about this document. Uh, I'm going to talk about it, and there's a little bit of, of interpretation. I'll try to quote from it as well, but my job here is to try to present to you the principles of voting as a Catholic um, so that you can apply that to the voting booths and the candidates and so on and so forth. If it helps or hurts your candidate, I don't care. Uh, my job is to simply talk about what the church teaches. Okay? All right, so uh, that's the ground rules. Voting in the Catholic vision, do you have to vote? Do you have to vote, yes or no? Yes, that's a moral obligation. Catholics are called to vote. It fulfills a number of aspects of the church's social teaching. We won't go into those now, but yeah, you should, you should vote. Do you have to vote for one of the two major political parties? No, you don't have to, for crying out loud. There actually are other political parties. You can, you can invent your own party. You can write in a party as long as their names are, are on the ballot here in Nebraska. The point is, is that you don't have to vote for one of those two major political parties. You really don't. And sometimes people say, oh, but isn't that throwing away your vote, right? Uh, isn't that failing your moral obligation as a Catholic, right? Because these two candidates, they're the only ones who could possibly win, right? So aren't you failing in your moral obligation as a Catholic to vote unless you vote for one of the two major political parties? And the answer to that is no. No, you're not failing. You're still fulfilling your moral obligation uh, because the reason we vote is not to win. That's not the purpose of our voting, right? <laughs> We're not trying to beat the other side. That's not why God asks us to vote. We vote in order to be faithful to God and to neighbor. That's why we vote. When the rich young man went to Jesus and said, how do I become righteous? He said, love God with all your heart, mind, strength, etc., and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we should do, okay? That's why we vote. Now, are there practical considerations? Of course there are, certainly, right? But it's not the main purpose for why we vote. We're not trying to win. We're not called to be successful. We're called to be faithful. Someone said that once. 
Thank you, Mother Teresa, Mother, Saint Mother Teresa. All right, all right, so conscience. What is conscience? I'll try to get through this pretty quickly. I, I suspect you probably all kind of know what it is, generally speaking. Uh, but conscience is a cricket that sits in your shoulder and tells you what to do and not to do, to do good and to avoid evil. That's what conscience does. It's uh, considered part of the mind or part of the reason that assesses certain situations, very specific situations. You always have to obey your conscience. Whatever it is your sincere conscience is telling you to do, that's what you should do. You should always follow your conscience. Is there any situation ever where a Catholic should ignore their conscience? No, there's never such a situation. Now, the problem, of course, is that at this point, Catholics and, and other people will simply stop and say, oh, so what you're saying, Omar, is that I, whatever my conscience tells me is the right thing to do. Now, I didn't say that. I didn't say it was the right thing to do. I just said you had to do it because your conscience told you it was the right thing to do. Because of the secret here is, what the people don't understand, is that your conscience can actually be wrong. You can make an erroneous judgment. It can be spectacularly wrong sometimes really, really wrong. Okay. So uh, that happens in various ways. Uh, you can get bad information. Uh, there's a Sally and John. Uh, John's an, an idiot. Uh, and you've known John's an idiot for years, and he gives you bad information, and you, you, you take it, and you do something wrong. Now, as, as far as you know, you were doing the right thing, right? Uh, your fault was listening to John in the first place. So you, you thought you are not culpable for anything, but you made the wrong choice. You actually did something that was bad, even though you didn't mean to you got bad information or right or the church talks sometimes about your conscience being dulled or uh, you can't hear you're deaf to your own conscience that happens when your vices take over in your life uh, you're just you're just so in love with eating pie at at village inn on free pie wednesday that you can't hear your conscience telling you for god's sake somewhere put down the fork you can't hear it anymore right um, you're just so caught up in that right that can happen too uh, or the third option is is just have a poorly formed conscience right you grew up in a society that told you that eating pie excessively was the right thing to do in all occasions, uh, and not much unlike our own. And so th that's why you had a poorly formed conscience, okay? All right, so that's why you have to form your conscience constantly. Everybody's born with a conscience. You, you come into the world with a conscience. It's, it's part of who you are. Every human being has it. Um, but when you're born, you don't always have a perfectly formed conscience or a well-formed conscience. Nobody comes out of their mother's womb knowing what the principle of double effect is, right? Uh, you have to learn that. You have to be educated to it. Now, whether you choose to do it or don't, your conscience will be formed. It's going to be formed somehow. Right? If you want to form it well, you need to make a choice to do that. That's an intentional choice on your part, and it's a lifelong task. I have people sometimes coming into my office, usually this time of year, right? every four years, they come to my office and say, Omar, if that's your real name, they'll say, Omar, I went to Catholic school for 12 years. I have a well-formed conscience, and, and I'd like to say, I don't say this, but I'd like to say, I say, on the inside, I say, I don't care that you went to school for 12 years at a Catholic school because your conscience is poorly formed now, right? Um, it, you're, you're making a wrong decision now. So it's a lifelong task. We are always have to be working at this. Now, how does one form their conscience? Any number of various ways, right? Parents form it, teachers form it, our laws form it, uh, culture, what are you listening to, what movies are you watching, what books are you reading, etc. Uh, your friends, what kind of friends you're hanging out with. I'm guessing everybody here is probably cool, so get people's names. Um, <laughs> seriously, that's why we have things like YCP, because you can do that. Surround yourself with good people, and then your faith. So uh, if you want to, everybody has a conscience. Do you have to have a Catholic conscience? No, you don't really have to. But if you call yourself Catholic, right, and you want a Catholic conscience, then yeah, you kind of have to have it formed by the Catholic faith. And it's the Catholic faith as it's understood by the magisterium. Not according to how Father Bob says, or Professor so-and-so from some university, but as the magisterium teaches it. Right? That's what a Catholic conscience is, if, if you want one, you know, FYI. All right, so uh, the last thing here the Catechism says about conscience is that we have to have a certain level of interiority. So very important in this day and age when we have so these wonderful computers that sit in our pockets and there are so many distractions and so many different things. Uh, there's very seldom an opportunity for us to have quietude or, or solitude or con a contemplative life or anything. We require, bless you, for... Uh, don't do that again, though, please. Uh, we require... I'm, I'm joking. I'm totally messing with you. Um, the, we require a certain level of interiority, some, some silence, so that we can actually be with our conscience and be with the Lord, which is why the sacrament of confession is such a great gift the church gives us, because like, we sit down at least once a month, hopefully, right? We sit down, we actually spend time with our conscience and say to ourselves, you know, conscience, why did I do that? And, and they say, because you like pie. All right. All right. <laughs> 
inordinately, you like. All right, so uh, doing good and avoiding evil, this is what conscience tells us to do. Doing good, uh, the, the church says, look, when you're doing good, there are lots of different ways of achieving the same good, right? Uh, when we're trying to achieve a good end, there are lots of different ways to achieve it. We all agree, hopefully, that we, we need, you know, there should be less poverty in the world, um, uh, there'd be uh, fewer killings, etc. I, hopefully we're all on the same page on that, but we can disagree on the best way to achieving that good end, different, different ways of getting there. Uh, when we disagree, it doesn't necessarily make you a good Catholic and me a bad one or vice versa, right? Um, we can disagree and still be good Catholics about that. Uh, you may be a horrible economist, right? Uh, or maybe I'm a terrible social scientist, I don't know, but, but it doesn't make us bad Catholics just because we disagree about the best way of achieving this good end. Unless, of course, the, the way we are hoping to achieve this good end involves something really, really bad, which is what we're going to talk about next with avoiding evil. Uh, the bishops are wonderfully very specific when they talk about this aspect of voting. And they say there are some things that are always and everywhere wrong. These things are called intrinsically evil actions. And a Catholic is required not just to avoid supporting these things, but required actually to oppose them. So it's not just good enough that you say to yourself, I didn't vote for that guy, it's okay. You have to ask yourself, what am I doing as a Catholic to oppose the advancement or the, uh, the increase of this particular evil in my society? What am I doing to oppose it? It's not just good enough that we say I'm not supporting it. Uh, now, the bishops give us a list, they're still very nice to us, they give us a list of intrinsic evils which are common today that are actually supported in the law or by certain political parties or that are part of the history or the milieu here in the United States. Uh, they divide them to dif two different kinds, direct and deliberate attacks on innocent human life and direct and deliberate attacks on human dignity. Under the first category, they list these things. Uh, abortion, euthanasia, human cloning, genocide, embryonic destructive research, and targeting of non-combatants in terror or war. Uh, these are the intrinsic evils, and this list is in the document Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship. So if you, if you want to see this, this is what's in the document. These are direct and deliberate attacks on innocent human life. A Catholic is never allowed to support these, and they have a moral obligation to oppose these. Okay? Uh, under the direct and deliberate attacks on human dignity, they list torture, racism, redefining marriage, treating the poor as disposable, treating workers as mere means to an end, and deliberately subjecting workers to subhuman living conditions. These are things that Catholics can never support, and they have a moral obligation to oppose these things. These things are always and everywhere wrong, according to the U.S. bishops. Okay? So this is the whole list altogether. Uh, people complain. They, they want other things left in there or put in there. Sometimes they'll say, well, why isn't death penalty in there? Well, because the church teaches there are situations when death, can, death penalty can be used. Right? We don't think it should be used now here in Nebraska in 2016, but there are situations where it could be used so it's not an intrinsic evil so it doesn't show up on this list. Okay? All right, and we can talk more about that in question and answer. Two temptations, two temptations. The bishops say there are two temptations in public life. The first is to fail to make ethical distinctions between different kinds of issues involving human life and dignity. Uh, every four years, every two years, people will come to me and they'll, they'll say things like, um, well, okay, fine, abortion is very important to you, um, but to me, the most important thing is an increase in federal uh, minimum wage to $15 an hour. Um, it's very important to me. I'm very passionate about that. And they're both life issues, so they kind of balance out. So I'm going to vote for the person that's going to support that particular issue. And the response from the bishop to that is, no. Mm -mm. no that, that doesn't make sense because uh, killing a million babies every year is way worse than whether somebody has $15 an hour in the job in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Okay? Not in the same ballpark. Uh, so you can't treat all issues as though they're exactly the same. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as the seamless garment argument. Uh, there are no distinctions, there's no hierarchy, everything's equally important. No, that, that's, you can't hold that view. You cannot hold that view. Um, the second temptation, however, is to ignore other serious threats to human life by appealing only to moral distinctions. And what happens here is somebody will come to me and say, I, I know the one candidate who's going to make abortion illegal, and that's the only thing I need to pay attention to. Uh, the bishops say, no, you're not allowed to do that either. Uh, you cannot use one single issue as the only reason why you would support that particular candidate. Why? Because your candidate may be pro-life, let's say, on abortion, but what's their position on torture or racism or targeting noncombatants in, in war? Right? You've got to pay attention to those things, too. You can't just ignore those. Uh, so you have, to, you have all those things you have to pay attention to. Okay? Um, you are allowed to, however, uh, el eliminate a candidate from consideration if they support intrinsic evil. So you can't support a candidate just because of one issue, but you can't eliminate a candidate for one issue if it's an intrinsic evil. Okay? Um, all right. 
Those are the two temptations. Now, here's the piece de resistance. The vo well, can a Catholic vote in support of somebody who supports an intrinsic evil? Can you do that? The bishop's answer is no and yes. Right? <laughs> and they're bishops, and they're allowed to do that. So, good night. No. Um, <laughs> No, they, they, the, the no part is this, this is what the bishops say. The bishops say a Catholic cannot vote for a candidate who favors a policy promoting an intrinsically evil act, such as abortion, et cetera, if the voter's intent is to support that position. So what does that look like concretely? This happens very often. I've heard this from Catholics. Otherwise, very intelligent Catholics will say this to me. They'll say, if we make something like abortion illegal, right, then what will happen? We'll start jailing young girls and, and maybe their boyfriends and maybe the dads and moms who paid for it, et cetera, and that would be terrible and unjust, these young girls who are afraid, et cetera. So therefore, in order to maintain a, a sort of a modicum of justice and moral order, I'm gonna vote for the candidate that will keep it legal and work for other ways to lower the abortion rate, and that's the pro-life position, okay? Uh, what I just explained, which is a very common argument, I see some eyes just say, nodding, uh, eyes nodding, I see some heads nodding, say they've heard this before, um, that, that's exactly what you cannot do. Because notice in that argument, what you're saying is, the reason I'm voting for that candidate is because I support the legalized abortion of people. That, that's why I'm voting for them. Okay, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do that. Okay, now, that's the no. What's the yes? The bishops say, uh, there may be times when you wanna vote for somebody who supports an intrinsic evil, Right, but you can only do that for tr other morally grave reasons. Voting in this way would be permissible only for truly grave moral reasons. And I love it when the bishops do this in case we're too dense to like, get it the first time they say it. They say it again, right? <laughs> so like seriously, for only truly grave moral reasons. Um, and so what are truly grave moral reasons? Well, they say it's not narrow interests or partisan preferences. Right? And what will happen, and this happens again, every four years, every two years, uh, you'll have Catholics who will say, look, I got these two candidates and I really want to vote for this one candidate, but they, they have this position on abortion or on another intrinsic evil or whatever. So I'm going to try any which way I can to justify that vote. So I, I had one person say to me, this was a number of years ago, they say, well, I'm going to vote for this candidate who supports abortion because the other candidate questions, questions global warming. And since global warming is an imminent danger to the entire world, and jeopardizes 7.2 billion lives, I have to vote for the candidate right, who's supporting abortion because otherwise everybody's gonna die. Right. Okay, leaving aside the validity or invalidity of, of global warming, et cetera, nobody believes that a four-year term of a president is gonna cost seven billion people's lives. Nobody believes that because it's nonsense. So the, the human mind is Olympic in its ability to twist and to turn and to do somersaults in order to justify what we want. We're very good at it. It's what we do. We're sinners. So we have to be very careful about what we're talking about. We're talking about truly grave moral reasons. We want to make sure we avoid turning narrow interests into partisan preferences. So when you ask, ask the, uh, the, the bishops, is there any way for us to more objectively understand what they mean by morally grave reasons? Uh, and the bishops say yes. Actually, in paragraph 37, there is a way. Uh, they say uh, you have to make sure that when you're making these decisions, uh, that you're guided to well-formed conscience. We got that. That recognizes that all issues do not carry the same moral weight. Okay, I read that earlier, bishops. And that the moral obligation to oppose policies promoting intrinsically evil acts has a special claim on our consciences and our actions. So the very first thing I should be doing is looking at the intrinsic evils. I should be comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Does this candidate support intrinsic evils? Okay. Does this one? Okay. That's a problem. How about anybody else? Right. And then what kinds of intrinsic evils are they supporting? Intrinsic evils that kill people or that just violate human dignity, etc.? In other words, what the bishops are saying is, uh, let's say we have a, a, a couple of candidates here. One supports an intrinsic evil, the other one supports five, you know, which happens every once in a while. Uh, the Catholic can say, all right, I can vote for candidate A, even though they support an intrinsic evil because of the grave moral problems of candidate B. So if I vote for candidate A, I'm, I'm blocking, in a sense, these other intrinsic evils from candidate B. A Catholic could make that argument. They don't have to. A Catholic 
could also say they both int uh, support intrinsic evils. I'm not voting for either one of them. That's perfectly reasonable because that's called sanity. But a Catholic could justify voting for a candidate who supports intrinsic evil if, in doing so, there are other truly grave moral reasons like blocking this person's ability to advance four or five other intrinsic evils. Okay? All right. I'm having troubles with this clicker. I think the battery is dying slowly but surely. But so after they say this, the bishops then go on to say that after we've considered this, the Catholic can, must or must take in consideration any day now, uh, these decisions should take into account the candidate's commitments, character, integrity, and ability to influence a given issue. So if a candidate comes forward and says, uh, I want to eliminate abortion, uh, and he's running for the mud board, dude, you're running, running for mud board. I don't, you're not going to do anything about abortion on mud. You're just not going to. Um, it also takes into consideration character and integrity. So if you have a candidate who's you know, broken covenant after covenant after covenant in their life, and they're regularly lying, and, and they're belittling people, and they're always running people off, and, and convinced that they've never done anything wrong, and they never have anything to apologize for, if such a candidate should, should exist, right, a Catholic would perfectly reasonably say, why would I trust you who are actually going to do what you say you're going to do when you've lied to everybody repeatedly over and over and over again? That's perfectly reasonable for a Catholic to do. Okay. All right. You have to be guided by a well-formed conscience. Uh, and the bishops end this section by saying we have to have a, a Eucharistic form of life, quoting uh, Pope Benedict XVI, uh, and live a Eucharistic consistency. So what I'm going to end with here is just to say, look, go to confession sometime between here and the, if you don't go to confession regularly, go to confession, clear your conscience, have a clear, clear conscience, uh, pray the novena, which is on the USCCB website, starts October 31st. Uh, pray for yourself, for your own sense of peace and guidance. Pray for the candidates. Pray for the country. Spend time before the Eucharist. Go to Mass maybe five minutes ahead of time. Just spend time with Jesus and beg Jesus, Jesus, please, God Almighty, what am I supposed to do in this election? Uh, help me uh, know how to vote. Give me peace with my decision, whatever it might be. Okay? Uh, do that because that's, that's what living Eucharistic consistency means. All right. Questions? Thoughts, concerns. Um, I have never voted before, and I am very overwhelmed. Where do I begin? Never voted before, very overwhelmed. So uh, where I would begin would be in front of the Eucharist. Um, and then, uh, practically speaking, uh, I would certainly go to, uh, there's a, a thing called Ballotpedia, uh, which if you put in your address, it will tell you who and what's going to be on your ballot. So it will give you some time beforehand to look at what choices you're going to have when you get into that ballot box. Because it can be very overwhelming when you're in there. I know I've been overwhelmed. What, who these judges are, what the issues are, what ballot referendums are going to be on there, etc. I think just doing that will give you a sense of, oh, okay, this is a little bit more manageable. These are the faces, these are the issues. And then start looking up these names, start looking up these issues. Um, uh, that's the wonder of the internet, etc. Um, and then if, if you're going to look at platforms and candidates, the National Catholic Register uh, just came out with a very good voter's guide put together by Matthew Bunce, my good friend, uh, which gives you, at least with the, uh, on the presidential race, gives you uh, what the church teaches on various issues, a whole bunch of issues, not just three or four, a whole bunch of issues, what the church is teaching is, what the party platforms are, and what the two major presidential candidates' positions are, which I think is very helpful as a start. But it's not the only place to go. Uh, I, I can't even emphasize this enough. Even if, even if the, the whole presidential thing has really kind of gotten you overwhelmed, there's still other very important races, the congressional race, uh, the ballot referendum on death penalty, et cetera. Uh, look on, on the, about those things. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Yes, and then over there. Right, so um, what she's talking about is in terms of writing in a candidate in the state of Nebraska, you just can't write anybody in. They actually have to have gone through a process. Um, if they've actually, if they've run in the primaries for either major, any political party, you cannot, you're not allowed to write their name in, even if they try to get on the ballot. 
Um, uh, so um, uh, you, they ha their name has to be, they have to have gone through a process to put in their paperwork. If you go to Ballotpedia, uh, they will show you who's eligible. Now, um, they won't show if somebody uh, just recently put in their name on the ballot, which has happened. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm not a huge fan of early voting, because not everybody who will be on the ballot we see November 8th will have been on the ballot when you get yours before you vote. Um, so that's why I would recommend waiting till the actual day till everybody is going to get their name in the hat has gotten their name on the ballot. Uh, they may not have a specific political party or maybe it's not really well organized, but they will have gone through a process to demonstrate there are enough people in Nebraska that support this person's putting their name on the ballot. Um, and, that, and then you would write in their name uh, or sort of check their box or whatever. That, that's kind of what I understand as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, if you're going to vote, you would, you would have to write in a third candidate um, or, or somebody whose name is on there. Um, so you'd have to vote for the Libertarian or Green or there's a Solidarity Party candidate who's going to coming up. I don't know if there's anybody else after that, but um, you'd have to check out um, uh, the Ballotpedia before, beforehand as much as you can. Uh, but you simply can't write in somebody's name, unfortunately, not here in the state of Nebraska. Wait, but in terms of like, our moral obligation to vote? Yes. Right. Yeah, you should still vote. You should, should still try to vote as much as you can. Now, again, the bishops do say there are extreme circumstances where you can choose not to vote. Uh, for instance, if you had a, a, an election where your only two choices or only three choices or only four choices all supported interest of evil, and you as a Catholic said, I simply don't want to do that, you can choose not to vote. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I also know not all of our electoral elements have to stay together. Right. What are the likelihood of like it being broken apart this year and it going to different parties? Right. So in the state of Nebraska, our electoral college is not required all three electoral votes to go to whoever won the majority. It can be broken up according to district. We have the three districts. So. Um, the question is, what's the likelihood of it being broken up? I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's uh, possible. It's happened in the past, but that was the first time in a long time. Uh, I, just, I just don't know. Yeah. But that's something to can take into consideration for sure. Yeah. Yes? What are those situations where the death penalty is acceptable? Sure. Okay, so the church is teaching uh, in, the, in the catechism, uh, this is paragraph 2241, uh, will say that... Um, you're allowed to use the death penalty when it's required to defend public safety or the common good. Usually they use the phrase public safety. Um, this is the tradition, goes, it goes, this goes back to Aquinas and, and, and Augustine. Um, uh, if you have such a situation, then you're allowed to use it. What the Catechism then says, though, it's, it's really pretty jarring, is um, if you, you don't have such a situation, if there are bloodless means to protect society without killing somebody, this is the actual words of the catechism, you must, you must use those bloodless means. Right? Uh, there's no wiggle room there. So just to be clear, the teaching of the Catholic Church, not the prudential teaching, not the part that you can kind of ignore, right? not that you should ignore them, <laughs> but the real teaching of the Church is, is if there are bloodless means of protecting society, you're going to use those means. Now, the prudential part comes in uh, here in the state of Nebraska if you say to yourself, okay, well, do we really need to use it here? Can somebody make the argument that we, we have to have the death penalty on the books in order to protect society? Is that the case here? Uh, and one might try to make that argument, um, but what I would ask everybody to keep in mind is that the burden of proof is on the person who wants the death penalty, not on the church. Right? not on those who don't want the death penalty, because the rule for Christianity you know, forever has been don't kill people if you don't have to. That's, that's the fundamental rule. Don't kill people if you don't have to. Is that helpful? Okay. Yes? Um, so I, sometimes I feel like my vote doesn't really matter because the elect college electoral vote is going to be determined anyways. So can you just shed some light as to why I should vote? 
Sure, okay, so um, my vote doesn't matter, the college electoral, and, and why should I? So I'll just say a couple of things. One, of course, the, the electoral college is based on the popular vote. So if you're voting, um, it could very well be the one vote that puts the person over. Um, now, in all likelihood, in a state like Nebraska, whereas, again, it was somebody said it tends to go one way, maybe not, right? But, but certainly they could be, and so there's a reason there. That's the first reason. But the other reason, and I'm going to tell a, a true story here that I think is really very important for us to understand, uh, this is a story about St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, Edith Stein, um, and uh, just an amazing woman saint. If you don't know anything about her, so she was a Jewish woman, uh, philosopher um, in Germany, uh, 20s and 30s, uh, got her doctorate in philosophy, uh, but they didn't allow her to teach at the university because she was a woman. Um, and, um, but she was just a brilliant woman, had studied under Shaler and much other people in, in phenomenology and, the, and personalism. She was, being a, she was an atheist. And she was a Jew, but she had this sort of openness maybe to the possibility of there being God. But more so, she was, she was in love with the truth. She wanted to follow the truth wherever it led her. Anyway, she's at a friend's house one summer. A bunch of friends are at this married couple's house. And then she's in the woman's library. And so she pulls this book off the shelf called The Story of My Life. She sits down and she reads it cover to cover in one night. She reads it cover to cover. And when she closes the book, she says out loud to an empty room, room she says, this is truth. And the book she read was this, this book, Story of My Life by St. Teresa of Avila, um, this great Carmelite saint we just celebrated a little while ago. Uh, she started learning more about St. Teresa of Avila. She became a Catholic. She became a Carmelite nun. Uh, and, um, and eventually the Nazis, who knew who she was because she had been a student, etc., tracked her down and they arrested her and sent her to Auschwitz and she was killed. Um, but we have some of her writings from before and, and after uh, she, her conversion. And we have this amazing story that she was in the convent and she overheard some of her fellow sisters uh, arguing with each other. And they were saying, why am I going to vote? It's all rigged for the Nazis. We all know this. What's the purpose of my voting? There's no point. And Teresa put down whatever she was doing. She walked over to her fellow sisters and says, no, you have to vote. Because your vote, when you vote, you're standing up against just injustices. If you don't vote, you're being silent in the face of injustice, and that's almost the same thing as saying it's okay. So even if it doesn't practically matter like in this world, in the quote unquote real world, <laughs> what C.S. Lewis calls the Shadowlands, we're living in the Shadowlands, right? The reality is that our voice against injustice is way more important. So that's why we should vote. Is that helpful? Good. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have to like think it's the, the less of two e the mm -hmm. lesser of two evils. That it is kind of a wasted vote. Mm -hmm. And none of I mean we all every count every vote should count. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much at stake there with the supreme justice and everything. And so I just think we need every good true vote for as much count as much things as we can. Right. So the the question I guess you couldn't hear was um, so the. This is a, a difficult election series. We're, we're supposed to vote for the lesser of two evils. Is that fair? For the lesser of two evils, um, because so much is at stake, and that any vote that doesn't vote for one of those is a wasted vote. Well, not so much a waste vote, but say, like, we want, we want the pro-life person to get mm -hmm. in. And if we don't, then it might go to someone else, and then that means more for the pro-choice person. So I just think we have to really vote for the lesser. Right. So you're saying. So here's the question, though. When we, I understand it's a, it's a good. Sure, it's a good practical argument. It's a very good pragmatic practical argument. Look, I have these two individuals. I want to make sure that we the less harm comes to society. I'm going to vote for the person that's going to do the less damage to society. Uh, if you don't like the phrase the lesser of two evils, somebody told me this, the, the weaker of two enemies. Look at it that way. Uh, I'm going to vote for the weaker of two enemies so that, therefore, the least amount of damage gets done. Perfectly reasonable, perfectly rational. I wouldn't uh, uh, say, because I just explained, look, if you have two candidates, etc., a Catholic could do that. What I would have a problem with is anybody saying a Catholic is failing in their moral obligation unless they do what you did. I would have a problem with somebody saying that a Catholic is somehow less a Catholic or less pro-life 
or less committed to the cause unless they vote for this lesser of two evils. It's a, that's what I would have a problem with. That would not be acceptable by, by, under Catholic moral theology. Um, and, and certainly you can try to argue with somebody and convince them, look, this is, this is what I think really ought to be done. Um, but I would just make sure, I'm not saying that's what you're saying, but, but there are people who do say that. They do say that somehow you're failing in your moral obligation unless you vote for the lesser of two evils. Well, Yeah, so, the, so how do we, I mean, I keep saying we have to vote Catholic, we have to vote Catholic. Right, so the, so the, the she said the, again, for you can't, the, it, it, it hurts when we hear the, the statistics that 50% of Catholics voted for pro-choice candidates in the last couple of elections. The things to keep in mind of that are, first of all, when, when they say 50% of Catholics, these are self-identified Catholics. Most of these Catholics don't actually go to Mass on Sunday, the, the ones who actually did vote this way. So, um, uh, they're not necessarily getting the church's teaching about these issues. Uh, maybe they don't know any better because they're not hearing it because they're not in church, they're not involved with, the, with, the, with their Catholic faith. Um, but, but more than that, I think it's very important for us to keep in mind that we want to make sure that when we're talking about these things, we're not calling into question the fidelity of other people um, merely because of the way they voted. Now, it could very well be, as we found out in some some emails this last week. Uh, it could very well be that there's some people who don't agree with the church. Their, their fidelity is out the window and they're open about it and they don't like their fidelity, they don't want to be faithful. That's entirely possible. But we shouldn't assume or jump to that conclusion just because of the way they voted. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Last one, better be good one. <laughs> yes, Mary. Ah. Maybe, and like she said, like Supreme Court justice. So maybe if like you don't like any of the candidates, that you can look beyond that. Can you talk on that a little bit? Sure. So uh, the 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 point is, maybe uh, if you don't like the candidate, maybe you can look at their party or the who they would put on their cabinet or what kind of choices they would make, etc. That makes perfect sense uh, to look at the whole package. Uh, you know, who are they going to be answering to? Who are going to be their advisors, etc. That is perfectly reasonable to do that. But again, as I mentioned before, if you're looking at the character and integrity of somebody and you, you have somebody who's running that never listens to anybody else, then that would also be a factor you'd have to pay attention to. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. God bless you.